Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Kent Branch October 2023 Educational Presentation. My name is Colleen LeBay, and I'm part of the Kent Branch Operating Team and your host for this evening. Angela Churchill is also assisting with this presentation, and we thank you for joining us. We do have a couple of housekeeping items. Our presentations are recorded and available on our Kent Branch YouTube channel, which is open to everyone. Your microphones and cameras have been turned off, but we welcome your questions. If you hover your mouse near the bottom of your screen, you'll see a bar with the chat icon. If you click on it, that will open a chat window and you can type your message or questions for us or the speaker. Angela will be monitoring the chat box for us tonight. Thank you, Angela. And before we begin tonight's presentation, Bob Daly, a member of the Lunapi Nation and a Kent Branch member, offers a territory acknowledgement. The land on which we gather, learn, and play is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lunapawak, and Potawatomi peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nations of this area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, the Caldwell First Nation, Chippewa of Kettle and Stony Point, Oneida Nation of the Thames, the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town, the Muncie Delaware Nation, and Wapool Island First Nation. Additionally, there is a growing urban indigenous population who make the cities of southwestern Ontario home. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. Okay, so let's get started. For anyone joining us for the first time, let me tell you a little bit about Ontario Ancestors. Ontario Ancestors, also known as the Ontario Geological Society, is a nonprofit registered charity which was founded in 1961. It is the largest genealogical society in Canada with a mission to encourage, bring together, and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. Be sure to visit the website to learn more about the resources and support available to assist in your family history research. Ontario Ancestors has over 30 branches and several special interest groups all across Ontario. We are the Kent branch and we cover uh, what is now known as Chatham-Kent, what used to be Kent County, and we offer assistance and education to researchers, and our mission is really to promote and preserve local history and family history. Our family history library is located on the second floor of the Chatham-Kent Public Library, which is in Chatham. It holds over 45 years worth of historical and genealogical resources for Chatham-Kent. We're open to the public on Fridays and Saturdays from 1 till 5 p.m. and we try to accommodate other times by appointment. We always like to contact, connect with people interested in genealogy and family history. You can connect with us at uh, our email address. You could also join the Kent Branch Facebook group which has over 850 people who are interested in genealogy and Chatham-Kent history. We have a very comprehensive website with lots of resources for both our, family, our branch members and the general public. And I, at the end of the presentation, I'll actually show you a little bit uh, because we've been scanning some of the resources from um, the churches that you're going to learn about tonight. We have an upcoming fall event on November 4th, which is a Saturday. We're planning a road trip to the community of Blenheim to visit the Blenheim Military Museum and Resource Center. This museum is packed not only with amazing military resources, but many local family histories as well. It's amazing. I've already been there with Cindy and we, we needed more time while we were there. Um, we will have lunch in town at the local Legion and then we'll wrap up uh, the trip of the visit to the Blenheim Heritage House Museum. We plan to meet up at the Blenheim uh, Military Museum at 9.30 if you're planning to drive yourself there. And if you want to carpool, you can meet us at the Cascades Casino parking lot at 9 a.m. and we'll drive from there. 
We would like to know if you're coming so that we can let the Legion know how many to plan for, for lunch. So if you are going to join us, please email us at kent at ogs.on.ca. And now let's get to tonight's presentation. We're pleased to have Eric Skillings joining us tonight to talk about the history of the churches of the South Buxton Charge and the Romney Charge. Eric was a farm kid, originally from a dairy farm north of Woodstock, Ontario. Um, Eric and his wife have two children and three grandsons. Eric came to the South Buxton Pastoral Charge, St. Andrews and St. Luke's as their minister on September 1st, 1998, and is still there. Rural churches were the hub of the community they served, and Eric has enjoyed sharing suppers and events with folks and families that surround our rural churches. Eric has become the minister for the community as well as the churches. He serves as uh, chaplain for the Merlin Legion and is on the boards for five local charities, including the Blenheim and Merlin Breakfast Programs. Eric is committed to rural church ministry, is on the board of the United Church Rural Ministry Network, serving rural and small town United Churches across Canada, including Yellowknife and Whitehorse. Eric feels privileged to share some history of some local Kent County rural churches with us tonight. Eric, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I will stop sharing and turn it over to you. Okay. Give me a second to get us up here and we should be good to go. So good evening, folks. Um, I could spend likely an hour and a half on each of the churches. Um, I'm going to quickly go through the first two and spend a little more at Talbot Street because I think it kind of shares a little more information of what's happened in the United Church, which is a collection of Methodist 75% of the Presbyterians and, and some of the um, congregational churches. There's been others since then. But uh, the, the Romney area seems to have a big significance of changes through the years. So I am spending a little more time on that. Um, but St. Andrews has, uh, well, we'll just kind of get right into it. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the churches that I serve. And to start off, uh, we have St. Andrews United Church in South Buxton, and it's at the Four Corners, uh, the, basically where the Red Star is. So uh, you get a little idea. Chatham is uh, just about 20 minutes north of the South Buxton area. So we're about 20 minutes south of Chatham. About uh, eight kilometers north of Lake Erie. So great. So the Buxton settlement started out as being the Elgin settlement, and it was the terminus for the Underground Railroad. It offered safety and then farms to escape slaves from the southern states. The settlement was actually started in 1849 with 20 slaves who were actually slaves of the family of Reverend William King. There's a whole story on that. But uh, now that they were Canadians uh, or in Canada and did get their Canadian citizenships, and they were able to be land owners in the Buxton settlement. So the black square gives you kind of an idea how big the Buxton settlement was, and South Buxton was right in the middle of it. So a log cabin church, uh, which also served as a school during the week, was built um, just down the road a little bit and behind the present church. And it was built through the first winter and it opened in April of 1850. And of course, it was a schoolhouse during the week and on nights, it was either for Bible studies, collection of community, and uh, and then church church uh, during the different church times, specifically, I guess, on Sundays. Although back then, I think they had church a lot more than just Sundays. 
So more slaves through the years came to Buxton in the next few years, and there were several thousand before emancipation in 1863. The settlement was a dream of Reverend William King, a Presbyterian minister. And as I said, there was a, there's a whole story behind this that could be another whole presentation. But the frame building in South Buxton today was built in the fall and the winter of 1857-1858. Uh, and it opened in June of 1858. Um, so the, the church in 1901 kind of gives you a little bit of idea of what it might have looked like. And the one on the right side is, uh, even though that picture is likely about 10 years old now, but gives us a good idea of uh, what it's like. So we just uh, celebrated 165 years in this building. And here's a picture of the present day inside St. Andrews. And as the slaves, so th these are some of the first families. Many of them are slave families. And I took them out of, we still have record books right back to 1849. And uh, so I took a lot of these out of the baptism books in that particular time. Um, as the slaves returned to the southern states after emancipation, the farms were sold to European settlers. And these are some of those folks whose descendants make up the majority of the area farms that surround South Buxton today. And many of these are also uh, mainline people in our church. And some of these uh, actually... Um, these are the early European family names. So yes, the families are still there, but uh, of course these folks have passed on because that would have been about 1880, 1890. So Reverend King also preached at area homes surrounding the present day St. Luke's church in the 1870s. So you can see that uh, if you see South Buxton's a little bit to the left of the Red Star, the Red Star is where St. Luke's is. This is a typical church differences in that time. Three miles by three miles. So basically, if you were at the four corners above the Red Star, you would likely go to St. Luke's. If you were much towards South Buxton, you would likely go to South Buxton. The three mile rule was kind of a person could walk or the horse and buggy would take about one hour to get to church. So um, you'll, you'll see this more dramatically a little bit later. And both of these churches are still rocking today. Maybe rocking's not quite, quite the right word, but they're still with us, so. So St. Luke's finally built the church. So the church, what you see on the right was the actual church. What you see on the left is a hall that was built in about the late 50s. And behind that is uh, is, is another hall that uh, uh, holds about 100 people. And uh, it was built uh, actually when they removed the horse barn. But that's another story. So they finally built this Presbyterian church in the winter and the spring of 1901. It opened in September of 1901. So 100 years later, in 2001, we had some very artistic people in our church who made this 100-year anniversary quilt. And it's a depiction of what the area may have looked like at the time, but you see the church. And you see the fields behind it were still forest, and that's a very good possibility that was the case. The tree is the artist's inception, but on the roots are the, uh, the original families, and on the leaves of the trees are all the families who have been part of St. Luke's since. I've circled in green the horse barn that's behind the church. I don't have a picture of the horse barn, but uh, um, it's on this quilt. In 1968, this is how many kids we had in Sunday school. So as you can just imagine, it was a rocking church at that particular time. 
that uh, each of the farms were likely about 100 acres. Uh, each family may have had four, five, six, seven, eight kids. I don't know too many, but eight, but four or five were definitely in normal. And uh, so there was lots of folks for Sunday school. So here are some of the early names which are taken off the quilt of those folks who are the early founding families of St. Luke's. And our next slide is families in the past 25 years to present. So that's basically these folks I all knew when I came. Uh, I buried most of them, but uh, life does go on. So St. Andrews and St. Luke's has always been paired as a pastoral charge, first as Presbyterians, and then after 1925 as the United Church. Both of uh, the congregations voted unanimously to for their Presbyterian churches to join the union with the United Church. They also served with the third church in the area, which I believe was a Methodist church, but it was closed in 1964. And then they were paired with another Methodist church called Grace United Church, which was on Talbot Trail. And uh, it was actually part of the Romney, Rom, Romney Circuit in 1859, which goes back a lot. So this is a picture of Talbot Street. Uh, you can see where Merlin is a little bit uh, at the 1, 1.30 on the clock type of idea. And uh, if you look a little more about two o'clock way up at the top, you can see a little blue church in um, a round circle. And that actually is uh, St. Andrews in South Buxton. So the pioneers of the Talbot Street area came between 1818 and 1830. Most were from England. There were a few from Ireland. The West Lillian Methodist Church of the United States, they actually sent traveling ministers into Canada. And one of the first ones was Nathan Bangs, who worked among the Protestants in 1801. And William Case was mentioned in some records, early records of 1805. These are not records that I have, but. In 1826, the Amherstburg Circuit was established and it extended as far east as Ridgetown, as far north of the Thames River. And in 1833, the area was divided and the Eastern part was called the Glowsfield Circuit. And the minister lived at a log house in Kingsville, and he traveled on horseback, hence the name of the saddlebag preacher. He conducted worship in homes, performed marriages, and christening. So the Romney Circuit, which is part of what we're talking about tonight, was formed in 1859. It included Tilbury West, Messira, Romney, Tilbury East, and part of Raleigh, which I believe, can't swear on it, but I believe that it actually was Grace United Church. So the first church that was built in Romney uh, was in 1854, and it was actually a frame building on Talbot Road where the Campbell Side Road now enters the highway. It was called the Ridge Church. It was considered non-denominational, would very much pull in people from the community. But that church burnt sometime between 1868 and 1870. Trinity is a church that's north of Wheatley on the um, Wheatley town line. And uh, it, it is still there, but it has been closed as the United Church and been purchased by another denomination. Its first church was built in 1874 on the Wheatley Town Line, Lot 9, Concession 4, Romney. And the new church was built on the same site in 1904. So that church actually has not moved. The Ridge Church congregation was taken over by the Methodist Church, and Salem Church was erected in 1874. 
uh, was closed in 1963. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, um, but uh, well, I'll tell you about that right now, is in the 1964, Kent Presbytery, as well as many other presbyteries throughout, likely throughout Canada, but definitely throughout London Conference, which is basically from Oxford County um, all the way to Windsor and then up to, well, actually it went up into here in Perth, which uh, goes up uh, almost to Wingham. Actually, I guess it does go to Wingham or did go to Wingham because we're no longer a conference anymore. But um, so the Kent Presbytery or reorganized pastoral charges in basically 1963 and into 1964, and it was actually tore down in 1968. So the next one is Zion Church. It was built in 1871 on the Zion Side Road. And Zion Church was closed in June of 1964 in that same restructuring. And I have a picture of the Zion Church. And um, um, it was sold after it was closed. It was sold and converted into a dwelling. So just down the road from the um, Trinity Church is Windfall Church, and it was built in 1884 on the Wheatley Town Line, a couple concessions south of uh, Trinity. It was named Windfall after the 1851 tornado that cut a swath through the forest a, mile, a half mile wide and nine miles long. Windfall was a Presbyterian church at first, but it later incorporated into the Romney Methodist circuit. And the Windfall Church also closed in 1964, and the property was sold to the Windfall Women's Institute. And their memberships were transferred to Trinity, just a mile or so north of them. Then we have the Victoria Methodist Church. It was built in 1901 on the Campbell Side Road. Regular services were held for about 20 years, only into, well, you see, 22, and uh, the church was uh, tore down in 1932. Similar thing happened to the Coatsworth Methodist Church, which was built in 1895, sorry, 93. Services was, were discontinued late 20s, and the building was sold and tore down again in 1932. So now we're back to what we know today as Talbot Street Methodist Church or Talbot Street United Church. But when the first building was built in 1872, it was a small red brick building, rectangular in shape, similar to the schools or the churches and halls of that period. And it was actually named Ebenezer Methodist Church. The brick for the church was killed on a local farm. It was known as mud brick. The foundations had field stone corners and they were quite low. There was only two or three steps at the front door. <clears throat> so even though it was built of brick, it was very, very close to the ground. And like I say, the foundation was stones. High narrow windows were on each side, the lower panes being frosted. The door was at the end towards the road and the chimney at the north wall. There was a bare wooden floor, wooden pews with an aisle in the center. A large cast iron wood burning stove at the back and this long stove pipe that went the entire length of the room. So basically a few hours before church, somebody would come over, stoke up the, the stove, and with the pipe going all the way through the room, it kind of gave you, for lack of a better word, central heating. At that time, the lamps were coal oil. There was a foot-pedaled reed organ, and services were usually held at night. Because the minister had 11 other appointments on his circuit, so he planned one service a month at Ebenezer. And on other Sundays, a local preacher was in the pulpit. 
So Reverend Ambrose Hunt was the first minister. And I would assume that was when the, uh, I'm just quickly looking, it's not coming to me. But anyway, when the circuit was made up, his salary was $685 for the whole circuit. His assistant was paid $246 and the lay ministers received no pay. So a lot of this is uh, from the early um, the, the early settlers kind of writing down their thoughts. And they talk about when they had socials, the ladies cut the cakes on the front pews. They made the coffee at Mrs. Um, Joshua's Coatsworth's house. Usually the tea was made at Mrs. George Dawson's house. The ladies washed the dishes on the front pews. The Ebenezer Methodist Church was tore down in early 2002, and the materials were used in the new building, which was built on the same site in 1902 and was then renamed Talbot Street Methodist Church. So this is a, an early church, uh, a picture of the early church um, before 1930. When the church was built, a glass bowl with a lid was placed in one of the cornerstones. It contains copies of official documents. And D.A. Shanks, who was a young boy at that time, remembers his father lifting him up to drop a $1 bill into the bowl. And that would have been in September of uh, 1902. This red brick building with its slate roof has undergone very few changes since 1902. Uh, the general appearance has not been altered a great deal. The stained glass windows are the very same. The belfry has always been there, but there has never been a bell in it. Yet in 1972, and you'll see that in the next picture, the church's centennial year, the bell from SS number one, you'll see it in 1972, just above the one, you can kind of see the uh, picture of the bell. The, yep, and uh, the bell from SS number one, Romney School, was placed on a cairn on the church lawn. On June 2nd of 1944, lightning struck the bell fry, but for the prompt attention of the neighborhood, they saved the church, which surely would have burnt to the ground. So you can see the church in 1930, um, and in the slide before that, so let me run back to that slide. You can see the, the horse barn just on the left end of the picture behind the, the uh, church. You can also see the horse and the buggy in front of the church, and we're going to talk about the horse, uh, the horse sheds a little later. Um, so, so as you can see in the picture in 1972, on the right-hand side, there was a large addition built on the east side of the church. It was built in 1968, actually, and included three Sunday school rooms in the basement, a large leisure room, and two bathrooms on the main level. By the way, when they built this church, they built it with a basement, which is... Uh, Many of the older churches have been lifted in the basements and put, been put in after. But by the 1900s, they were putting basements underneath because I think people knew that they were the collection place for communities. The double glass doors replaced the wooden ones on the front entrance. That would have been in 1968, 1970. Uh, going back a little bit more, the first ceiling was tin, which was embossed with an ornate design and painted in pastel colors. And this type of ceiling was very similar and very popular in that time in residential homes, but in a church where there was no heat all week, the paint peeled and particles dropped in the room, which likely happened on Sunday morning also. There was a new wooden ceiling that was put in in 1924. So it's a picture of the church and um, the one on the left-hand side, it's from the back of the church, looking up into the encove, the pulpits on the left-hand side. And 
there's so many flowers there, but in between the flowers is the altar rail. It's a curved altar rail and it's in front of the church. Um, at one time in the Methodist church to take communion, you come up and knelt at the altar rail, very similar to what I've seen in Anglican churches. Uh, now we actually, well, um, pretty much all my life, um, communion has been served in the pews. Sometimes we do what we call intinction, which is we have the cup and a plate of bread and people come up and then take it and then go back. So in 1902, the first heating unit was a large wood burning furnace in the basement that had grid, grid, grids into the bottom floor. Natural gas was discovered in the area, so two church members who worked for the gas company converted the church furnace to burn gas. But during World War II, there was a ruling that if a heating unit could burn solid fuel, it could not have gas. So the old furnace was changed back to wood. Later, but still during the war, several gas stoves were placed in the sanctuary. After the war, a new gas furnace was installed. And again, in the 70s or 80s, it was replaced by another gas furnace that provides hot water heating to the building today. So here are some of the earlier families that we've kind of talked about. They're ones that I've pulled out. Uh, some of these would have been in times of both churches. So the development of lighting options have been experienced at Talbot Street through the years. In 1902, there would have been carbon gas lights. They worked with calcium carbine, and when water dripped on it, gas was produced. The gas came out of two jets, and when ignited, made a clear, glowing light. They did not need a chimney. And even though when the water dripped on the mixture, it would be a foul smelling gas, but when it was burnt, there was no odor. So natural gas came along and they used the same pipes to um, send the natural gas to the lights. And of course, uh, gas lights require a white mantle that many of us are um, quite familiar with, with our propane camping stoves. And today we have small square boards in the ceiling covering the holes where the gas pipes used to come into the room. And so here are some of the present families. And many of these, again, are people who go to the church. Some of them have passed away, but they've been going for the last uh, 20 years anyway. So in 1960, a Hammond order, organ was purchased. And the basement has been used and is still used for Sunday school classes, social events, and dining. So again, this is a picture pre-1930, uh, which shows the horse shed at the back. But horse sheds have disappeared completely in the last 90 years. Talbot Street's shed was sold in 1930 to the neighbor who tore it down and used the wood to build a small barn. So therefore, I know that this picture is pre-1930. The shed was for the protection of the horses while their owners were in church. The building was long and narrow and closed at the back and at both ends. It had a peak roof of cedar shingles and the gray walls were a barn siding. And I don't know what's just coincidental or not, but the three horse sheds that I were aware of they all open towards the south. And that may be because the south wind would have been the least um, cool wind. <laughs> the horses and buggies or the horses and cutters were driven straight in. The horses were driven straight in and the horse was tied to an iron ring on a timber along the back wall. In cold weather, they would throw a heavy wool blanket over the horse. And after church, they would take the blanket off, back the horse out, and out of the shed, jump in, and away they go. People also had heavy robes over to put over their knees for warmth. And in the summer, they would wear um, light cotton lap robe to keep their Sunday best clean from the road dust. Very few, if any, of the roads would have been paved in that time. 
There's another article of historical interest for the horse buggies. And there's a it's it's called the little seat, and it was for the children. It fit in the buggy behind the dashboard, and the children would ride backwards, so I guess their parents could look after them. And it lacked the comfort, and the horse's tail often switched against their young faces. But there seemed to be no choice to keep track of your young riders. It certainly was not popular with the kids. And one of the advantages of growing up was that you got too big to ride in the little seat. And then in the early days of automobiles, there, were, there was no antifreeze. In winter, the water had to be drained from the radiator when the car was not in use. And for that church hour, people would put their cars in the shed and they would throw a robe over the radiator to keep it from freezing. And church sheds were sometimes used for summer festivities as strawberry socials, chicken suppers, and picnic dinners. So this is the part that I kind of want to share with you is how many churches there were and if you see the black uh, triangular diamond shape, I guess, uh, which is South Buxton, Merlin, Tilbury, Talbot Street, and Wheatley, they're the five active churches in this particular area. And as you can see that Talbot Street and all the other churches were combined together in a circuit riding which actually included some more towards the left into Essex County and even some more further, um, further to the north. Uh, I'm thinking one of the churches they mentioned was Tilbury West, and I wonder if that was Quinn, but again, I don't know that. So in 1872, there were 12 appointments on the circuit. The Ridge, which was Salem, Ebenezer, which is Talbot Street, Wesley, don't know, Raleigh, I'm guessing that was Grace uh, United Church or Grace Methodist Church at that time. Victoria, which uh, is on this map. Um, Tilbury East, uh, not sure which one that was, whether Tilbury East may have been Glenwood, but again, that's really only a guess. Um, Bethel East, not sure. Tilbury West may have been um, uh, Quinn which is closed and tore down now. Um, Comber, which is a fair ways away. Randalls, Union, and Zion. In 1902, Talbot Street Methodist Church shared a minister with Zion and Salem. So basically they were doing Talbot Trail, the three churches on the bottom end here. The three-point circuit continued till after church union in 1925. In the 1930, Glenwood United Church, which is the one right above Talbot Street that's kind of in a rectangular with rounded corners, it was closed. And it was added to, sorry, it wasn't added to, it did close, sorry. In 1930, Glenwood United Church was added to the circuit and it remained a four point charge until 1964 when, when Presbytery got involved. Uh, the comment was the timetable was quite complex with one church missing a service once a month. And in 1964, a major change was made that Glenwood, Salem, and Zion churches were closed. And remember that was the year that Kent Presbytery realigned the churches. Merlin absorbed the majority of the Glenwood congregation. Salem was added to Talbot Street. Some Salem families, because they were either living in Wheatley or were closer to Wheatley, decided to go to Wheatley. Zion went with Trinity as it was closer to that. And Trinity also absorbed the Windfall Congregation. And then Talbot Street and Trinity were joined to form a new two-point, we call them pastoral charge, it might be called a circuit. And some of the families from the Coatsworth Church in Coatsworth, which is, well, you can see where the red star is kind of to the left of uh, Talbot Street. They joined the 
uh, Talbot Street United Church at that particular time. Many of that was still in the early uh, years, but uh, that basically gives you an idea and you can see how Presbytery uh, likely had to close these churches because many of them would not have had many people in them. And again, today we're kind of going through that situation and uh, churches are trying to work out their own solutions for themselves. But thank you so much. We've been uh, just about a half hour and a little bit more. And so if there's any questions, I believe that um, is it Colleen you're going to ask them or? Well, uh, Angela will ask. Uh, we'll be Angela, checking yes. okay. for the questions. So thank you, Eric. Okay. Uh, I'm going to actually, yeah, I'm going to stop my share. Okay. Um, Angela, are is there any questions? No, I'm not seeing any questions yet so okay. i thought uh, i was very interesting eric you mentioned the one church i think it was the Talbot street where um because they had discovered natural gas in the area that they converted they converted the church heat to yes. natural gas and then as yes. regulations yes. came in they had to convert it back um i used yes. to work at, i used to work at union gas so i completely get the regulations <laughs> wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to do it today would have to have um sp specially trained uh gas fitters to do that but uh, very ingenious uh, at the time exactly <laughs> and the fact that they were able to convert it back to meet the regulations <laughs> yes <laughs> to what i mean yes yeah yeah uh, and just for uh everyone's um, knowledge eric has been very generous in sharing a lot of the church records with us and um maybe what i'll do is just share my screen briefly and I'll show you where you can find them on the website. Um, wait one second. If you uh, are not a member, <clears throat> you can also come into our library and access these records on our visitor computers. Um, if you are a member, you can visit the uh, website and go to members library. And there are a number of different types of records we would be looking for church records here. And they are organized both alphabetically and by township. Um, so you, if you're not familiar with what the townships used to be, you may want to go to Wikipedia and um, look. But in this case, I think I put most of the records in Romney Township because I think the bulk of them really um, pertain there. So the uh, there's the pastoral charge, um, burials, births, marriages, baptisms, those are all available in there. And then I believe I also put some in Raleigh Township. I'd take a guess because some of them I think cross the cross the line. Oh, South Buxton pastoral charge is available yeah. in here. South, yeah, South Buxton, um, St. Andrews and St. Luke's are both in Raleigh. Right. So a lot of a lot of so records you, that we've You can. guessed right. <laughs> Good. Yay. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Um, so yep. if you are a member, you can access these from the comfort of your home. And if you're not a member, you're welcome to come into our library. We've got two visitor computers and you can access them. I will warn you, <clears throat> because our computers don't get used all the time, the first time you try and c connect to these, sometimes it'll say access denied. If you just try again, it'll reconnect to them. They just don't get, uh, they only get used a couple days a week. So, so um, I guess back to you, Angela, are there any questions? No, not not seeing any right now. Okay. So if I could just share one thing, behind me you see the three churches, St. Andrews and St. Luke's are the top two churches, and they were the ones that I came to in 98. And in 2011, <clears throat> um, we we brought in you know what we call a ministry sharing agreement we brought in the folks from talbot street which were a, a single what we call a single point pastoral charge and so that we we've, we've been working in that agreement for uh, basically 12 years very favorably and um 
And uh, so I preach at this point. I'm every Sunday at St. Andrews, which is the white church. The other two, the first and third Sunday, I'm at St. Luke's at the top. And the second and fourth Sunday, I'm at Talbot Street at the bottom. But those both congregations, uh, like 60% of them and 70% of them, go back and forth to the other church, which gives me about 50, 55 in each church on a Sunday. So it's quite nice. Just Looks give good. you a little bit of recent history. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you, Eric. That was very interesting. I think I um, found it quite um, informative. I thought the talk about the horse barns, too, is sort of whimsical and interesting because I think I was telling you before we started that I used to go to church with my grandmother and the horse barn was back behind the church, which is you sort of expected to see it. So uh, with that, we'll wrap yep. up for tonight and hopefully we will see everyone out on November 4th to the Blenheim Military Museum. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, folks. Eric. Have a good night. Okay. Bye-bye.